Robin Hood Radio presents Stage Right or Not with Michelle Willems. Michelle is a longtime journalist and herself is a published playwright of several theatrical works. She's a frequent contributor to the Huffington Post, Daily Beast, and the Atlantic websites. Well, I was at four theatrically inspired events this week, and the connecting thread was music. Yes, songs helped me get through Depression-era Duluth, the racism-charged early years of America's pastime, the haunting memories of a soldier damaged in the trenches of war, and even a memorial for a producer gone too soon. Now, let me say up front that only two of these are actually on stage as we speak, one on Broadway, one off. Another is in development, and the last, well, it was a one performance show only. So, the public theater has had numerous productions that were major hits there, and then moved to Broadway, where they didn't necessarily soar. The winners, most famously, include a chorus line and that rap musical about an immigrant turned founding father. Well, the public's latest gamble is Girl from the North Country, written and directed by Irishman Connor McPherson using the music of Bob Dylan. I reviewed it favorably at the public, but I was somewhat unsure of its appeal to a larger audience on a broader stage. Well, I think it has been faithfully transferred to the Belasco on 44th, but I'm still not convinced that it will be the cup of tea for tourists looking for a feel-good dance down the aisle. Let's just say this one ain't the temptations. But if you're like me, you will shed some tears. No, we didn't turn out to be forever young and feel so damn proud to have lived in a time when Bob Dylan was writing. Story-wise, Girl from the North Country is slim. It takes place over a few days in 1934 inside a boarding house about to go under in Duluth, Minnesota, the birthplace, incidentally, of one Robert Zimmerman who came to be known as Bob Dylan. It is narrated as a radio play of sorts by a local doctor character. We get to know, not deeply, but enough about a dozen others, from boxers to Bible-selling con men to single pregnant women to a troubled grown son or two. We feel their pain and root for their escapes from such poverty and bleakness. And this is not, I repeat, not a typical jukebox musical. You likely will not hear your favorite Dylan songs, though the show does include at least bits of some 20, including Like a Rolling Stone, All Along the Watchtower, and I Want You. While there are a few solos or duets, most eventually feature the whole cast congregating as a harmonic community they try to become. The songs don't necessarily spring organically from the narrative, but they do feel relevant and somehow hopeful at the right moment. The performers play a series of instruments, drums, tambourine, bass, and piano. Wisely, there are no pauses between the narrative and the songs. Applause would break the mood. As we know, pain comes at all kinds, says the narrator. And then the music and those Dylan words come. She was a backwards, backwoods girl, but she sure was realistic. She said, boy, without a doubt, have to quit your mess and straighten out. You could die down here, be just another accident statistic. There's a slow, slow train coming up around the bend. The production is not short, two and a half hours, and hardly a laugh in it, though Mayor Winningham, as the boarding house's madam, slowly losing her mind, earns the most. Whether this will be a show with strong word of mouth or continue to divide audiences as it did at the public or feel like the right tonic at this time, Well, that's up for grabs, but congrats to the public for giving it a shot. Now, over at Playwrights Horizons, a new piece called Unknown Soldier has just opened. The book and lyrics are by Daniel Goldstein and the lovely music and other lyrics by Michael Friedman, who died tragically two years ago. This is rather an unexpected pleasure. I did not even know it was a musical until I arrived. The story here deals with at least three female generations of a family living in Troy. A whole song is dedicated to that town's being named the worst in New York. The family, with the help of a nerdy and seemingly lonely Cornell University librarian, is trying to uncover the story behind a photo of a soldier from the First World War. Was that their mother and grandmother in the photo, clearly much in love with the nameless man? 
The piece is a musical mystery, a tale of lost loves and longings, and the overarching theme, one of my favorites, is memory. What we choose to remember, as one song goes, and what we choose to forget. The music is beautifully performed and even filled with complex thoughts. One, one song is called A Milkshake. It's not just a milkshake, and it has some meaning. The show is 90 minutes, and frankly, it could lose 10 or so. There is repetition in some of the songs, and I wish it had taken the approach of Girl from the North Country and allowed them to blend into the stories rather than pause for applause. The cast is surprisingly large for playwrights, 11 extremely talented folks, including Estelle Parsons as the grandmother who finally looks back and recalls the love of her life and makes us all realize that we have family members who have or have had more interesting lives than we ever knew. Now, I mentioned I saw a reading of a play in development, hopefully for the Hartford stage in Connecticut. It's called Johnny Baseball and imagines the story behind the 87-year curse that haunted the Boston Red Sox. Now, this one will be worth following as it makes its way through the long and winding road of getting a show, particularly a musical, on a stage. Here, too, the music and lyrics by Robert and Willie Real are what stand out, while, as so often happens with these projects, the book needs work. The history of shows about sports is not a glowing one, damn Yankees being the gold star, but Johnny Baseball does try to tackle how racism impacted the sports stars or potential stars off the field as well as on. And no, there is not a song devoted to sign stealing. Finally, the lights on Broadway were dimmed on a recent Saturday night in honor of producer Margot Lyon, a Baltimore native. Lyon's biggest achievement, most likely, was creating the Broadway version of Hairspray, the movie of fellow Baltimorean John Waters. Lion won the Tony, and that play continues to perform all over today. But she was also a key player behind the careers of directors Jack O'Brien and George C. Wolfe and playwright Tony Kushner, all who spoke at a beautiful memorial at a Broadway house last week. Guests were given playbills, and the service went from songs from the shows that Lion either produced or invested in to speakers who had wonderful stories about her. Now, personally, she did three great things for me, first introducing me to a potential candidate named Barack Obama. She was an early and huge supporter. As president, he placed her on a national arts board. Michelle Obama sent a moving video to the memorial. Second, Lyon also first told me to keep an eye out for a musical she had just seen an early reading of, that being Hamilton. She invested a relatively small sum, and well, the rest is history. Finally, when we were putting on a benefit for our children's theater program and looking for some entertainment, she suggested we use a cast from her upcoming show, then in rehearsals, to do with our kids. That show was Hairspray. Let me say it was a night to remember. Well, now you have your template, she said to me later. And yes, for the next years of our benefits, we would find a cast of a show to perform with our students. Margot Lyon's voice and courage will be missed, though the plays she helped bring to life, including Angels in America and Caroline in Change, are still with us. Caroline, in fact, is about to enjoy a revival on Broadway. Starts previews this week. So, yes, another interesting week, Jill, filled with a lot of emotion and a lot of theatrical names worth remembering. And, you know, the really interesting thing is it's a reminder... You do, one doesn't necessarily spend enough time uh, with the behind-the-scenes folk, right? Because right. you know Margot Lyon. If you if you if you read your playbill, you will have seen her name in all sorts of things for many. In in it's a memorable yeah. name. Yes, but if yeah. you don't, and a lot of people don't, it's just like, huh, huh? Yeah, right. Or what does a producer do? Exactly. And you know, yeah. And she did it all. She was a producer who was something like Hairspray, literally created it. I mean, from start to finish, the whole thing was her idea. She went to John Watt. You know, that was all hers. Things like Hamilton, Angels in America, she may not have created, but she played, played important roles in, get, in, cre- in getting investors, you know. So there are all kinds of producers, as we know. And, and she, she, 
He yeah. was a, a, a lot of each, so to speak. Somebody's got to, you know, somebody's got to produce. It's like produce. Um, I vaguely remember the, uh, the hairspray uh, was trying out in Seattle, I believe. Yes, it did. And that was one of the excellent examples of working something out, out of town. Which Margot always did with her shows, by the way. Um, well, Angels in America also started in, I believe, Seattle, and uh, at Seattle and Los Angeles before it came to New York. Uh, but Hairspray, yes. And the last show that Margot was working on, God, I don't know if that's ever going to happen. And that had just been done in Seattle about a year ago. Oh, I can't think of the name of it. It's based on a wonderful Indian movie. I don't think it's ever going to make it to New York. Maybe now they would do it. but So she definitely had a relationship with Seattle, but she always took shows out of town. I once followed one a show that she was trying to get up, and I followed it to San Diego, and she had big stars in it, but, you know, and beautiful songs, but they, once again, they couldn't get a good book, and it never opened, never opened anywhere. Um, but that's the, the point. One, yeah, who told me about that issue with most musicals. You know, the music is the easy part. <laughs> The stuff that comes in between is not so easy. Right, because you just never know. You know, someone just randomly bursting into song has become you know, better for skits than it is necessarily on stage. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I took my son to see the Bob Dylan show, which he liked, by the way, because um, he loves Dylan. He said he wishes that there were more Dylan songs and less of the talking, you know. Um, but I think they did a good job of, of blending that together and uh, again that's going to be a really interesting show to watch and see how it does grow from the north country especially at this time you know we don't have to talk here about people being scared to even go to a big theater with a lot of people at least right now you know let's hope that passes but we're in the middle of a crisis right now so shows like that you know I tell people if you want to see Hamilton this may be your time to go because a lot of people aren't going to theater right now. They're not going to any big events, as you know. All this is going to be worth watching. Stage Right or Not with Michelle Willens, produced in the studios of Robin Hood Radio, robinhoodradio.com.